Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our Victory Fund Sunday Social. <clears throat> and this was actually started so that we could stay together even while we were uh, doing social distancing. And I think we've got a really great program uh, this morning. I want to give you a little bit of background uh, as to where we started um, Sunday. Social series is meant to be a behind the scenes conversations with uh, LGBTQ leaders who are doing great work. This will last about 45 minutes. We will take questions from the uh, audience and uh, like to make sure that you pay attention particularly to the comments that we have about the upcoming election, because indeed this election, uh, it's been said before that it's the most important in our lifetime. And I'll go a little bit further and say, it's not just the most important in our lifetime, our very lives depend upon who we elect in November. And so with that, uh, let's get started. We've got uh, some powerhouse women who are leaders in their own state and in their own right uh, that are helping us to make sure <clears throat> make sure that our voices are not just heard, but make sure that policies uh, that are passed within legislatures are not just friendly to us, but taking into account that we are indeed people. And so it's not just a matter of patronizing us. It really is a matter of making sure that there is equality and equity. So today I'm excited to be uh, joined by three LGBTQ women leaders of the states on the West Coast. Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins. Way. Um, we have <clears throat> California Speaker Lori Jenkins of Washington. We have speak, Speaker Cote of Oregon. Where's my Senator Pro <laughs> Senator Pro <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going a little bit faster than, than the internet will allow me. So tell me to just slow down. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Senate President for Tim Atkins, who is the first out les lesbian elected speaker of the California State House and the first out lesbian and first woman to serve as the president of the California State Senate. Good morning, Senator Atkins. We also have with us Speaker Jenkins. He is the first one speaker and the first out LGBTQ speaker of Washington State House. And Speaker Kotek is the first out lesbian speaker of the Oregon State House and the first out lesbian speaker of any state legislature in the country. She took the post in 2013. And I wanna thank you all for, for being here. Um, let, let's just start with, with the role that you play within your, within your states. And you, you know, you know, what's exciting about, um, having this conversation with all of you, because anytime I read first, anytime I read, uh, the only one, it, it always reminds me that most of what we do that will be documented in history is the fact that we're all pioneers and we are forging through a road where they're is no map, but we are not lost. We're pioneers. And I, I, I always kept that in mind when I was in the military, uh, understanding that being part of the first wave of women who were uh, branched uh, automatically into a, um, a support group, not the wax, and then going into another uh, service, but always kept in mind that the things that I did during that time were going to either make room for more or it would just make their um, their ascension uh, harder. So uh, thank you all for being fellow pioneers. Um, so can you all briefly tell us the role that your leadership plays in each of your states and uh, how does that affect the, uh, the bills and the votes that you have? Uh, and we will start with, it looks like Senator Atkins, are you there? Okay, let's start with um, uh, Senator Jenkins. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Senator Spearman. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. And, uh, you know, I started my political training with the Victory Fund um, a long time ago. So it's always great to be engaged uh, with, uh, with the Victory Fund and with uh, all of the uh, individuals who are uh, connected to the Victory Fund. Uh, you know, I'm pretty new to my job. I was elected by my caucus not yet a year ago, uh, even. Um, so I have been telling people recently, if I make it through, uh, the next year, I'm kind of golden. Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, like there, what else could happen? What else could happen in the future that I wouldn't be able to draw on these experiences? Uh, but I, I'm, as I'm learning, you know, I'm, this is my 10th year in the legislature in Washington. And as I'm learning the in Washington, the speaker of the house is incredibly powerful. 
Uh, I have the ability to decide every single bill that comes to the floor. Um, negotiate, you know, obviously negotiate directly with the Senate and with the governor's office on um, on topic areas, and also on the political side, uh, have historically um, the speaker has made all decisions about spending on uh, races and things like that. That is not how I've moved into the role. Uh, I've developed a much more team-based approach to all of that uh, because my belief is it'll strengthen our decision-making um, to have more than one person making those decisions. Uh, but if I, I guess if I so choose, I could be the only one making the decisions. I just don't so choose to have it that way. Uh, there's always a difference in the way that women govern. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> always. We're, we're more, more participatory. Yeah. Um, Speaker Kotek, um, how about you? And, and, and let me say, I think that we were together at the 2016 DNC. Uh, seems like we passed um, in the hallway there. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good morning, Senator, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it's a beautiful sunny morning here in Oregon and uh, been a big fan of the Victory Fund over the years. They were very instrumental in my very first race uh, when I was younger and less gray uh, and just want to thank them for all for all their help. Uh, well, you know, what's really interesting right now to be state leaders is while we have incredible mm -hmm leaders at the congressional level um, in our community and in all communities trying to do the right thing. It's very difficult uh, for the federal government to get things done right now because of our president. And so a lot of the um, way that we are frankly staying alive and getting things done is at the state level. And you will notice in, in states where you have more progressive governors, progressive leaders trying to keep people safe and you know build a more just and safe, healthy future. It really is landing to state legislators and state legislative leaders to do that. Uh, we just got out of a three-day special session and I'm happy to talk about that in a bit. But um, when you're speaker or the Senate president or Senate pro tem, depending on the state, you're the per person in the room with the governor. You're the person in the room saying, what are we gonna do next? Um, and while legislators individually have a strong role to play with their constituencies, it really does fall to legislative leaders like the speaker, uh, in my case, to sit in a room with the governor and our Senate president and decide the next course of action. And uh, I have to tell you, when the pandemic hit, um, we were just coming out of our uh, regular short session. We were moving into campaign season and the world changed overnight. I've never worked harder in my life in this time of an election year trying to make sure we have the right public policy in place. So I think anyone who lives in a state with good legislative leaders, they're feeling safer and healthier. And we have a lot ahead of us right now. And, and I'm just, I feel really fortunate to be in the role I am right now. Thank you. Senator Atkins. Thank you. Um, well, I'm thrilled to be here with two incredible, well, three incredible leaders, uh, women. Uh, I have to say, when I became the speaker uh, before I was uh, Senate pro tem, Tina Kotek reached out to me early on. And when Lori became the speaker, uh, we reached out to her because what an incredible thing. And I'm thrilled yeah. to be here with Jennifer, my spouse, who I met at a Victory Fund fundraiser in 94 for our trailblazer who is on the call, Christine Kehoe. And, um, you know, it's not lost on me, uh, the responsibility we have on the political side. I wouldn't be where I am, uh, the first uh, President Pro Tem woman, LGBT, were it not for these women on the call. And I was thrilled to meet and, and see Senator Spearman because of her history and her background. And um, I will say um, on the political side, um, victory has been uh, what has helped me be successful, not only getting elected and building the bench, but in terms yeah. of personal development through the Harvard mm -hmm. program, through yeah. the campaign trainings, through all of that work. Um, and I think now more than ever, it's important not to take victory for granted because yeah. while we have uh, we have achieved some measure of success and we help others, we cannot forget the foundation. Mm -hmm. And right now, as everyone is struggling, uh, resources, et cetera, 
I'm going to be focused on my commitment to victory. And I know that uh, former Senator Kehoe and my mentor who's on the call is, she went back on the board in order to give back now that she has retired from elected life. In terms of governing, um, I, I couldn't agree more with my colleagues. You know, I've been able to negotiate five budgets as speaker and as pro tem with the iconic Jerry Brown, a little bit frugal, that guy, a little bit frugal. Uh, but thank God we were frugal together because right now, California, uh, we just uh, got our budget passed. Between, we got a two-party agreement. I told Victory last week and a three-party agreement this week with the governor. And now I'm working with Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, you know, being in the room and able to do that with experience and having spent a decade where California came back from when Chris Kehoe was in the legislature to a $40 billion deficit, a $27 billion deficit when I got elected in 2010, yeah. to a $26, $27 billion surplus or reserve. We went into our now $54 billion deficit with a $26 billion reserve, which meant over the next two years, we, we talk about flattening the COVID curve, we are trying to flatten the economic curve in California and see how we can make this stretch so that we're not cutting valuable critical services for vulnerable Californians. And so I think experience matters, training matters. And, uh, you know, I will just end on this. Governing in 2020 is sort of like playing Jenga, for those of you who know that game, on the teacup rod at Disneyland. Everything's swirling. You have to be careful. Half moves don't count. Moves that look easy could actually bring everything crashing down. And at the same time, we're trying really hard not to get sick. So mm -hmm. I couldn't be more pleased to be with this group of legislators leading the West Coast and Nevada. If the San Andreas fault goes, you're on the coast, Senator <laughs> Stearman. Uh, I'm just thrilled to be with everybody today. Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> Senator Atkins, I think um, I think uh, we are more like um, Eastern California, and you all are Western Nevada because we have so many people from California who come this way. So uh, we're probably real close uh, before we get to the San Andreas Fault uh, divide. But <laughs> but thanks anyway. You know, you uh, you all mentioned something about the importance of, uh, and I think it was. Um, uh, Speaker Kotek, you said the importance of being in the room with the governor. All of you all said being in the room with the governor, talking about the, the budget and talking about the money and all the processing. One of the things that struck me in the midst of this pandemic, well, a couple of things. Number one, the people who are at highest risk uh, for contracting and uh, for it becoming fatal, COVID-19 being fatal, are the same people that we all know have been disproportionately um, have been disproportionately attended to. We, we we talk about people who are over 60, 65 and over. We talk about people with high blood pressure, with diabetes, and all those comorbidities. But then we go back and if we look at policy, it really shouldn't be any surprise to us. The one layer that I've not heard people talk about yet is how does previous public policy, public health policy, how did that contribute to the contracting and uh, the demise of people within the LGBT and, and here's the reason why I ask that, because here of late, uh, we have rightfully so turned the spotlight on our trans brothers and sisters. And I know many times members of the community the, they, they won't go to the doctor a couple of reasons. Maybe they don't have the money. But the other is that uh, some of them just don't want to be subjected to those the kinds of stupid questions that we might get. How have you all seen previous public health policies um, make way for the pandemic as it is affecting our community disproportionately, I might say? And just anyone can go first. Uh, I, I mean, I'll I'll start. Um, I, so I've spent 20 years, 25 years working in a public health um, career. And uh, so I think one of the biggest challenges, my experience of public health is that 
pure public health has been incredibly worried and interested in trying to engage on health disparities for a very long time. And at least in Washington state, part of the challenge has just been incredible disinvestment uh, in public health. And if I think that this is one of the opportunities of both uh, uh, the COVID virus, as well as the Black Lives Matter movement to bring more attention to public health, to the prevention aspects of public health and um, what it can do to try and help people uh, uh, keep healthy. I, uh, I work, as I said, I, I've worked in public health and I work at our local health department. And one of the things we've been spending a lot of time on over the last few years is, you know, everything from uh, redlining to voter disenfranchisement and how that actually relates to people's long-term health and ability to engage in community and to vote. And so um, one of the things about public health is that we think um, we think that everything in the world is public health, those of us who work in the field. Um, because what we want is people to have true, real engagement uh, in the world, in the electoral system, in their community, to be able to have an effect to uh, building their community as they um, as they want to build it, and have real voice and real power in doing that. Um, in the end, my like my favorite definition of public health is taking things that were once thought to be um, unchangeable and permanent and changing them forever. That's public health. Um, and uh, so I, the other thing I would say is here in Washington, I've been really excited. One of the things I've been able to get the Senate and House leadership on is an equity tool that we will start to use in our budgeting. Pro we haven't been using anything like this before, but uh, we will start using it in our budgeting processes and in our policy development processes so that we're making, everybody likes to talk about equity and having an equity lens on things right now. But then when you ask folks, what does that mean? They're like, um, I should just, I don't know, think about things, equity is important. And so I think that's a good place to start that people think it's important, but um, what we really need are tools for people to really use and apply to see how it impacts our policy making uh, and our budget writing. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that's going to help transition, uh, even though we're in a huge uh, budget deficit for Washington State's budget, it will help us make better decisions about um, think budget cuts we have to do. But I hope it'll also help us be more persuasive to pass progressive revenue in this state. We happen to be ranked as the state that has the most uh, unfair and regressive tax structure mm -hmm. in the nation. Yeah. Uh, but we've got to... Um, we really have a lot to do in that regard. Go ahead, Tina. And I apologize, I had to change rooms. Um, can you um, remind me um, specifically, because um, Lori, Lori is the public health expert and I couldn't agree with her more on um, the equity conversation. We're at, a, we're at a really critical moment in walking our talk in terms of what we do around our budgets and what we do in terms of protecting impacted communities. We have disparate impacts here in Oregon. I'm utterly frustrated by our inability to make progress there. Our Latinx community has disproportionate impact in COVID, our Pacific Islander community, our black community. And the odd thing is that, well, the ironic thing is we knew this would probably happen. We know that we have very vulnerable populations and the LGBTQ community also very vulnerable. And um, I feel like we got caught flat footed and now we're trying to catch up. And I think as we recover, and we were talking earlier before we got on uh, the live call here, the interrelatedness between the economic recovery and the public health response, if people don't feel confident about going back into the stores or going back to work because they're afraid, we're not gonna recover. If um, we don't keep people safe until there's a vaccine, this is going to be a very long recovery. And the irony of it, and the really important thing to keep in mind is the communities most impacted by COVID right now, dis disproportionately, are the same folks who are gonna go back to work. The risk in the recovery is not the same. Low-income community, low communities, communities of color, are those essential workers in our stores, cleaning our offices, uh, um, doing those types of things that are really, really important right now, 
and we're not keeping them as safe as we can. And we as leaders have a very important responsibility to make sure um, these impacts aren't happening like this. And I think we're still trying to figure out how to do that. And I know all of us are focused on that right now. And um, we want to recover. We want everyone to be kept safe. And those two right now connected are really hard to maintain. I, I think what I would add to that, I, I, the interrelatedness of economic opportunity as well as communities of color or, or ethnically diverse communities uh, is really important because in California, because um, we have been able to have some economic uh, surpluses the last couple of years, we have been engaged in trying to make sure we have health care for everyone, including undocumented individuals. Uh, we're not 100% there. We had moved into un, uh, health care for undocumented seniors. We got young people last budget cycle, but now we're sort of on hold, but we got to keep pushing it. Not just that, but access to data. I mean, in this, we have a Democratic run uh, legislature, governor, all of the constitutional offices. And yet, as we entered into this data collection around COVID, we weren't collecting data on LGBTQ numbers. And so we know that the numbers are high for our communities of color, but we really don't know about LGBTQ. And we had to talk to, in the midst of chaos, we had to bring it to the attention in not the most pleasant way with our administration. Like, how do you know whether we're being disproportionately impacted? But an, a good example of this, California has continued and we are not perfect. The data collection is really important. Mm -hmm. And covering healthcare, covering healthcare for everyone is critically important. Because even when we do those policies, this is why the policies as we go and who's in legislative office to be responsive to those values, that the diversity of our population is reflected in our legislative leaders is important. Because while we had health coverage for all these populations, one of the things we learned, I did a bill on this several years ago, is that if you had access to Medi-Cal, our state-funded health care um, program, Medicare, Medi-Cal, um, if you had cancer, if you're a woman who had breast cancer, you couldn't access Medi-Cal again for coverage of breast cancer in the same breast. Now, if you got it in the different, the other breast, you could. And there were time limits on how long you could access the Medi-Cal. None of that makes sense to someone who has breast cancer. And if you also looked at the numbers, uh, black women had a higher incidence if we looked at our numbers in California for a period of time. And so that policy made no sense. And it took me three years doing the bill again and again and working it through the budget to say, this is arbitrary. And so my point is, we can look at the broad picture, and I'm glad Lori's here with that expertise. Healthcare, you know, from that perspective, public health is something I'm interested in, but it's not necessarily my expertise. We got to hit those policies one by one by one, and you would think we'd be able to do it without having to make those points, because it just seems self-evident to me that that is a ludicrous policy. We got rid of it, mm -hmm. but that is the importance of the work we do as also legislative leaders, because uh, we can we can pull that card when we have to and say, but I'm the president pro tem and this matters to me and we're gonna get it done. Yeah. And so working together, um, you know, I think we have to look at the interrelated. We have to look at, you know, in pandemic, uh, the pandemic, we have unemployment insurance, thank the federal government for the money they've sent us, but we didn't cover undocumented folks. So California found a way to give resources to those who are contributing to our bottom line, our economy, our tax base. And we found a way to do that, but we have to work extra hard to make sure those things happen. And so um, I love these conversations because it allows us to talk about kind of uh, the deep dive into why these policies matter. Yeah. You know, I was listening to you talking a few years ago. Um, we were in Tacoma, Washington, and uh, for CSG, and Mae Jemison came to talk to us. And she made she made the statement. Uh, she used this illustration to make the statement that it matters who's at the table. Absolutely. She said, you know, when she was younger, if you got breast cancer uh, back in the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, 
uh, the first thing they wanted to do was to say a mastectomy. And she said, for years and years, women were taught that was the only way. And she said, and then something came along called prostate cancer. And all of a sudden, people felt it was important <laughs> to find a cure, <laughs> to find a cure. So the difference, you know, for women, you know, it was get rid of it. But when it was prostate cancer, it was, oh, my God, we got to find it. Yeah. Oh, no, no, there's got to be something else we can do here. So it really matters who's, who's at the table. Uh, I, I think one of the things that we've talked about inadvertently, but I really wanted, I want, I want us to bring this to the forefront, and that is so many members of the LGBTQ community, particularly the trans community, did not have jobs, were not, quote, employed um, in, in typical work environments, if you will. Uh, some of them because uh, of the draconian laws about who you can and cannot hire or fire. Uh, and for some of them, it was simply a matter that they did not, they their, did not comport with what people thought their gender was. And so it was difficult for them to, to work. How, how has this impacted that particular part of our community? And what opportunities are available now for us to fix it? Because, you know, uh, Tony, you, you said the undocumented workers and, and to a certain degree, the group that I just described, they're undocumented as well. Yeah. You know, there, there was some big work, but, but not a lot. So, so from an economic standpoint, and, and, and here's, the, here's the real ugly truth. The real ugly truth is this, that for some, of, some members of our trans community, uh, it has not only has it been difficult to get um, uh, what they call acceptable work, but for some of them, uh, it has really led to them being uh, a part of the sex workers community. And the same people that look down on the sex workers are usually the ones that keep them employed, if you understand what I'm saying here. So, so I think there's some opportunities, but I'm not exactly sure. Number one, how do we identify those opportunities? And then how do we work collectively? Because, you know, the beauty of us talking about this from a regional point is that if something takes off in, in, in Washington, Lori, there, it will probably work in Nevada. Just like the one uh, Senator Becker had a, a, a bill, I think you all have its uh, data collection. Uh, and it helps to keep the uh, uh, health care prices down. So if there's something one is doing and the rest of us can learn from, how has this pandemic opened up opportunities for the part of our community that has been undocumented, undercounted, and therefore underfunded? Well, this is a great opportunity to lift up all marginalized communities because when, I mean, those of us who were legislating in the Great Recession, uh, we want to learn from that. A lot of people were hit hardest first and had the longest time to recover from what had happened. And we don't want to make those mistakes again. I mean, if we can do a kudo out to the federal government, when they went to the pandemic unemployment assistance program for um, gig workers, independent contractors, folks who don't couldn't qualify for regular unemployment benefits, that has that has been really a great new tool for us to use. The challenge is it's been very hard for our states to implement. So my team spends a lot of our daily uh, going, comings and goings trying to get our employment department programs to work better so folks aren't falling through the cracks. Um, and if you think about our, our transgender brother and sisters in the this whole new new or revived conversation about police brutality, they're also at the front lines of that as well. And so this is a really, I think, emotional time for our, our community and trying to do keep people safe, make sure they have what they need when they have you know, worked on the margins, uh, some of the folks in our community, and then trying to make police reforms uh, to move forward so people can feel safe uh, working with the people who are supposed to be keeping them safe. And uh, I, you know, I want to just say what you have here with the three of us, particularly on the West Coast, and it's great to hang out with Senator Spearman, is um, we all like compete with each other a little bit. It's like, oh, you're doing that in Washington? I totally want to do that. Oh, you got that in California? And of course, Oregon's always leading the way, no offense, but you know, but we're always trying to compete with each other about doing the right things. And we have such a camaraderie uh, because of who we are and, as women. Um, and as uh, lesbians, it's like, okay, let's do this, right? Uh, so we feel, 
it's it's really an asset for everybody who lives on the west coast to have us in charge you know i'll add i'll jump in and say one of the things i think is really important and i i have to say in honest in all honesty black lives matter and what's going on with police reform has given us an opportunity to also talk about our trans black sisters Absolutely. which have been largely ignored if there is a, a wrong of whatever black trans women and men are are down there and but we've got to use this opportunity not to just make statements but to make it real if we don't make it real in terms of our actions then we've lost an opportunity and um you know ricardo lara our state insurance commissioner was a senator and he did a piece of legislation in his uh, last two years in the Senate where he it was a right to work and he highlighted the transgender community. And we did um, press conferences up and down the state talking about who these individuals were and what they were contributing and how, you know, we were systematically excluding uh, job opportunities. And we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. But um, because I think even just introducing a piece of legislation and being visible about it, um, you know, we, we have got to make, find ways to make it real and, and about people's lives. And we have not yet done that. And, and so I think we have to build on those things. We have to take advantage of every opportunity. Uh, and that is legislatively. And for those of us in states that can do that and push the envelope, we need to do it because it resonates throughout the rest of the country. Yeah, I think exactly. I hadn't really thought about this this morning when I got dressed, but here's the shirt that I'm wearing today. Um, uh, uh, so I'm a t-shirt kind of gal. Um, if I could wear it, if I could wear t-shirts and preside, that's what I would do. Um, but I, you know, it's been, I think that the job, the job piece for um, our trans uh, allies is a much more challenging piece than some of the other things that we've been working on. But I do think some of the other things that we work on actually help. Uh, for example, um, you know, here in Washington, we have uh, been able to, uh, for example, make it clear in legislation that I and others have run uh, that trans, um, that members of our trans community will get health care. They will get full health care. Uh, including uh, requiring insurers to cover uh, sur surgeries and and other things, and so that helps that helps stabilize lives so that folks can then focus on other things. Um, likewise, I was just it was one of my best calls of the week. I just had a call with a, a group of uh, Black trans women this week who are very active on housing and housing issues, especially for black trans women and us working on housing issues. And one of the things you see again in public health is when you stabilize people's housing situation, people's food situation and their healthcare situation, it does let them turn to an employment kind of focus and not having to focus always on just mere survival um, but then to build their lives. I, you know, I, I think there are also other things we can do in the workforce setting and having had, uh, you know, anti-discrimination protections um, for a long time has been helpful, but, but I don't think it actually solves the problem. Of, um, so I think some of what both Tony and, uh, and Tina said uh, in terms of, I guess, I think the LGBTQ community has gotten more comfortable and supportive of, of trans members mm -hmm. of our community. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do with the broader community um, and the work that we do there to be uh, good allies. So one of the things I'm trying to do as an ally though, is let the trans community lead me and tell me what it is that's most important to them right now so that I can do those things um, and be helpful there. So, so here's one, one of the things that, and, and um, Laura, you brought up a, a good point. I, I, I say to people, when I walk into a room, whatever your prejudice is, I'm probably going to challenge it because I walk into the room with my African heritage. I walk into the room with my woman nest. I walk into the room as a same gender loving woman. I walk into the room as a veteran. I walk into the room as an ordained minister. And there are a couple of those 
uh, parts of me that appear to be incongruent. So whatever your prejudice, if you've got a prejudice because of color, I'm going to challenge it. If you, if you are, are a chauvinist, I'm going to challenge it. If you're homophobic, I'm going to challenge it. And I say that to say that I think it's good for us to look at this issue, the issues that are coming up in the pandemic from the standpoint of intersections. Because I think a lot of times what we do is we, we compartmentalize this part, this demographic, and then we'll move to this demographic when indeed there are some of us who occupy all of them. And when all of them are affected, the African-American community is disproportionately affected. That is me. You know, women are disproportionately affected. That is me. You know, when, when, when we start talking about LGBT, that is me. And so the intersections, I think, are very important for us as a lens for us to look through. I, I want to I move over just a little bit because um, I think, Tony, you may have touched on, and I think, Laura, you did too, uh, when you said it's not just enough to look at legislation for hiring and job um, uh, protecting people's jobs. I think that this pandemic has afforded us an opportunity uh, heretofore that has been overlooked. And that is, how do we train our community for 21st century jobs? For example, in the trans community cannot get work because their look does not comport or people are offended by who they are. So instead of trying to help them get a job with someone, one of the things that I'm trying to do, I'm looking at doing is getting legislation that will help people to become employers. Because if you are an employer and the community, most likely you're going to already have, have an understanding of why the legislation or why getting this job is important. I want us to look at, at what the work can afford us in terms of uh, environmental opportunities. You know, uh, how how we can train for uh, environmentally conducive. For example, uh, we have here in um, Las Vegas, you may have heard that there, there was a worker at the casino who passed away last week uh, from COVID related uh, complications. And uh, the culinary union issued a statement, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, you know, indicating that they were going to they were going to sue. Well, it's not just casinos that will have that problem. Every building where there, where the public comes in and out of, to include our state houses, are going to have the problem of how how do we make this environmentally safe? There are some people who are are using uh, sanitation e uh, efforts, using steam or using other types of maybe chemicals or whatever. But but those are job opportunities. When we stop and we look at uh, tech. More and more people will be working from home. I don't. I, I think some of the companies are going to realize that they can decrease their operational costs by thirty percent just by keeping having most of the people be telecommuters, and so that will go away. So that that will mean that there will be more jobs available in the tech industry. And so I want to. We only have a few minutes left, but I just want to ask y'all: What can we do, looking at the environment, looking at renewable and clean energy, looking at uh, technology? What can we look at in terms of creating opportunities to create jobs, entrepreneurs, empower entrepreneurs within our community? And this is something, you know, that I would I would like to see the next time we get together uh, at the leadership conference in D.C. I'd really like to see us focus a little bit more on not not just getting a job, but how do we empower ourselves as entrepreneurs? And I'll stop. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm kind of passionate about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is such an interesting um, economic recession, right? Uh, it came up so quickly. Uh, you know, the usual things don't seem to apply because, for example, in, in previous downturns, people would go to community colleges where I would see an upsurge in classes to learn for people to learn new skills, for example. Well, our community colleges are having a difficult time operating because some of their most hands-on classes, they can't operate because uh, because of physical distancing requirements. So we don't really have that automat that more established route to get new skills and new jobs. I want to give a shout out to my labor commissioner, Val Hoyle, here in the state of Oregon. She started a new certification program for um, folks who can get licensed or at least certified to be up to the latest on um, 
cleaning techniques. Hospitals need more people to come in and uh, sanitize and do some things. And, you know, you actually need to know what you're doing there. So she started a certification program for mm -hmm. a, you know, a one week program where you could get a certificate saying, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know how to keep people safe and keep things sanitized um, and getting them into the hospitals for additional work. Um, that's some short term work. But frankly, until we have a vaccine, we're all going to be really much more appreciative of the folks who've been taking care of us in terms of cleaning, janitorial services, those types of things. And uh, that is something we're going to need because not everybody can stay home. Only the people who have certain types of jobs have that luxury of staying home. So in the meantime, we're going to need some more folks out there uh, helping other folks who have to be at the job site. Well, thank you. I, I might just add very briefly, uh, it was something that as everything else was swirling and going on, our governor put together uh, an economic recovery task force and has had some incredible speakers. Now, I hope this task force isn't going to go the way of task forces in the past, the 21st century this or the, but I will say I like the value statement. Uh, Tom Steyer, who's been a big Democratic supporter, was a presidential candidate for a while. Uh, he is here and he is leading that with um, the governor's chief of staff, Ann O'Leary. And the focus I like is, is the value statement around um, the economics of who's, who's going to disproportionately pay the price of this pandemic. And it is, uh, you know, we talk about all of the lenses, uh, Senator Spearman, all the lenses we put our own experience through. You know, class, we don't talk a lot about. It's as relevant and cuts across every issue. And that's something that they talked about uh, as we look, looked at the economic recovery. And there's a jobs component and a, and a climate and sustainability component and a people who were already been left behind. As we entered this pandemic, there were already people suffering. There were Californians suffering that we were trying to start new programs for. And so I'm really excited. There's former governors. Um, but but the real piece is the um, the labor leaders, frankly, who, who disproportionately, some of those unions, SEIU and UDW, the United Domestic Workers, et cetera, they disproportionately represent the communities of color, women, um, and, and they're at the table trying to help us with the workforce piece because I think we entered this behind. And so I'm looking forward. My um, Senate Democratic Caucus put together an economic recovery group, and we offered an economic recovery idea that isn't about raising taxes, but it's a way to look at our budget and take money sooner. And we want to we want to focus on job training, sustainability, climate, and uh, small businesses and small business opportunities. So more to come. Hopefully, we'll have more to share. We're 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 in the midst of this while we're trying to do everything else. You know, pass budgets and end our legislative session here in California. But I think it's an opportunity again. And I think if Lyndon to what um, Speaker Kotek said, and I'm sure Lori has already talked about how to walk forward with people as opposed to just dictating from on high and getting the input on how we move forward. I think we've got some real opportunities, uh, even as we have to adjust how we use the resources that we have, the limited resources. Yeah, and I just want to uh, add, I see Michelle Gonzalez has uh, asked a question about federal stimulus dollars and getting those funds to small minority and women-owned businesses. And I would say, I don't think we have uh, in Washington cracked the code about how you how we affect the feds in this way, uh, but it seems pretty clear there has been real disproportionality in who gets those federal loans. So one of the things we've been doing here in Washington is we um, we released some money early on for small businesses here in Washington, but we continued to hear that they were primarily small white-owned businesses that were getting um, that were getting loans, and so we're looking at a second round of those. And maybe uh, I'm. I don't think we're exactly certain how we will do this, but one of the things we're thinking about is rather than giving the Department of Commerce the money to uh, send them out, giving a bundle of money to the Office of Minority and Women-Owned Businesses here in Washington and have them distribute and have it distribute it to uh, those businesses that are registered with them. Uh, we also, and we talked about immigration a little bit earlier, 
here in Washington, I don't know if it's this way in, in the other states that, that you three are in, but immigrants are most likely to have small businesses um, in our state. And they are, the, they are the group that the federal government has not only not funded, but is openly hostile to. Uh, and so doing work that we can uh, in that realm I think is something that we are really focused on in addition to things that everybody else is uh, talking about. You know, our tech industry here in Washington, we have Microsoft, we have Amazon. And one of the things that's great about, that's always been great about them is in any kind of anti-LGBTQ political environment that we've had with bathroom bills and, you know, pro prohibiting domestic partnerships and marriage. The tech industry has always been a leader in helping us defeat those in part because they're a, they're a little bit, um, it's just interesting, they're kind of purist and like they want the best people in their tech industry and they really, they're kind of neutral about anything else about anybody. Um, and so they have this idea that they're very unbiased, but it also, which I don't think is, I'm just saying, I don't think that's true, but, um, but it does help them try to protect our community politically because they feel like it's, uh, disincentive for their recruitment of workers to have anti-queer legislation happening in a state. They don't, they really don't want that. So that's, that has been a good thing for us too. And I think everything that everyone else has recommended, I'm taking some notes on some of this, so we can do it here in Washington. Can, can I add, um, and, and I, we're taking notes too, but the importance of leadership, <laughs> you know, um, when you're trying, you mentioned, Lori, um, immigrant businesses uh, and that typically undocumented folks have found a way to have small businesses and work in a different kind of economy. When you have legislators who are willing to take that on, it's why we were able to. And, and of course, there's pushback from colleagues in the legislature that don't agree with you. But if you are a leader, you get to decide how to push and support policies that will help economically fund. So when we did the pandemic unemployment insurance and created an undocumented fund to, to help. Uh, that is um, a point of where we can be effective and use our influence. And we can't do it all the time. I mean, we're not omnipotent and we don't have all power, but there are moments where we can make that difference, Lori, and make sure the policies and the resources are there. And that is when you can do that, there's nothing like it when you realize that you have done something that impacts incredible um, policies and communities that deserve it, that need it, and who should have access. Exactly, and, and uh, you know, I think I think you just hit on something. Um, I want to I want to answer a question. I think that Alan uh, asked about um, making people enforcing a um, uh, a mask, every a mandating a face mask that they have to be worn. One of the things that I noticed, I don't go out a lot because um, my respiratory system was compromised when I was at the Pentagon. Uh, so that like puts me way over the charts in terms of um, having, you know, being susceptible to this. And uh, my sister lives with me and she is also a dialysis patient. So I only go out when I need to. And if I don't have to go out, I don't go out. Uh, but but here's what I noticed when I went out uh, yesterday to, to pick up some items from the grocery store. There is a big there are big signs inside the store that say you must have a face mask on before you enter and keep it on while you're in here. And so my challenge would be to the business community. If you make this mandatory, then it doesn't fall on us to try to legislate it, because if it is a business practice and it goes back to what businesses are always saying, wanting to have some autonomy. Uh, it's in really in your best interest because uh, I'm trying to remember which court was it. I want to say it might have been a district court that ruled that if someone catches uh, COVID-19 and it connects back to your business, to your office or wherever it is, then you can be held pecuniary liable for that. So it is in business's best interest to make sure that that happens. So I would just say in Texas, uh, HEB is probably one of the largest employers there. And HEB in Texas is like Smith's or Kroger. Uh, in other places, uh, if HEB says that you must have a face mask to come in here and for all their employees, they have to work. I promise you, you'll start seeing a cultural shift in terms of 
who is for face masks and who is not. Um, we, we're just about out of time, but I wanna get this in really quickly. We've all uh, been elected and sometimes because of who we are and sometimes in spite of who we are. I always ask the question of myself, now that I'm here, so what? What does it matter? What does it matter? And so I, I'd like to just kind of go around the horn and, and, and ask you all that question. Now that you're here, so what? What is the what is the so whatness of relevance in terms of you being here and staying here? And I think that's important for us to understand because there are members of our community, LGBTQ A plus, who are running for office, and sometimes people don't understand that it matters who's at the table. So now that we've been elected, so what? Well, I guess I'll start. Um, and well, first of all, to anyone who's running and who's watching this, it does matter. So we're glad you're doing it. Um, and one of the things um, that I think is important for all of us is despite whatever our personal experiences are, we have some inkling of an understanding of what it means to not be part of the majority culture. And as a white person of privilege, I have a lot to learn. And yet that little bit of understanding goes a long way in this moment when you're trying to explain to your uh, oftentimes white male heterosexual colleagues that uh, you need to put you, you need to understand the perspective of someone else right now and you need to let them lead. And that is something that um, as LGBT leaders, we've had some experience with and we can help our, particularly in my case, my colleagues of color to just let them run with these ideas and, and have their back from behind and just help them out. That is so important right now when decisions are getting made in a moment of transformation, you need different perspectives at the table. And um, Victory Fund has such a huge role to play in that. Um, the way they're supporting candidates of color, transgender candidates, we need more perspectives at the table. Public policy gets made by the people who are in the room. And I just can't stress enough how important it is for people to support Victory Fund and Victory Fund candidates right now because the world is changing and the people in the room will create that world. And I just wanna see more folks in the LGBTQ community in those rooms. Very good. Lori? Go ahead, Lori. I agree. Um, well, I mean, I'm snapping because I couldn't agree more um, with what Speaker Kotek said. Um, you know, and because of that interconnectedness, because of our, it, it's not, um, the oppression that minority communities feel and experience is very different depending on your community, but we are interconnected in that we can, we, if, if we want to, we can actually understand those connections much better and understand what it feels like to support one another and realize that uh, it's likely the same uh, systems that are oppressing all of us um, and that we need to break down. Uh, and that's one of the things that is tremendous about Victory Fund and its commitment to, uh, to electing out LGBTQ people um, and, and, and out racially diverse LGBTQ people, because not only do we make the decisions around the table, but um, the diversity of those people around the table make better decisions for everybody. I, I do think sometimes it takes us longer to get to a decision because we have very diverse perspectives. But in the end, the decisions that are made are always better for the broad population than they are when they're made by a, um, a group that has does not have diversity. And so I will always choose a little bit more time and a little bit more understanding for better outcomes um, in the end. Uh, so, I, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm really excited about, I'm scared but excited about every, all the opportunities we have before us. Um, and I think, um, it's, I'll just tell one quick story. Uh, I was also the first out lesbian elected to the Washington state legislature. And early on in my, um, legislative service, I had a Republican come over to me and say on the floor and say, why do you, my, my wife, I have a son who's now 19. He was nine when I was elected. 
And so why do you always have to like bring up your two mommy stories in all of your floor speeches? And I looked at him and he goes, you're just trying to get us, which I thought was great that he thought I was getting him by, by <laughs> doing that. But, um, but I finally, I Good said, to him, you know, that's not about you. That's my life. That's my life. And my life is very similar to a lot of other lives out there. So I'm just speaking to my experience about my community. And I think that's fair. And he's like, oh, so it's not really about me. And I said, no, no, it's not about you at all. He's like, oh, okay. I mean, he did. I didn't change his vote necessarily. And actually, we ended up with this very funny game through the rest of the session. Every time after I spoke, I would pick up my floor phone and call him, and I would say two mommies, and then I would hang up the phone, and he would look at me and laugh <laughs> and point. But um, right, even those little experiences help move people a little bit and help understand, help people understand that there's a wide diversity, um, and we have a lot of people we represent. So I, I would just very quickly add, because time is limited, um, you know, we've lost ground. As successful as we think victory has been, and we have been as an LGBTQ community, we have lost ground. We have to continually look at the Supreme Court ruling recently. And so those people who think, boy, there's so many gay people out there running and they're so successful, isn't it enough? Isn't it enough that we have, you know, two U.S. senators and you know, et cetera. No, it isn't. It isn't because we've got to continually fight. And it's not nearly enough because the perspectives are not being presented. As Lori said, we are not including everybody. And as diverse as California is, we got to continue to look. We're going to, I have two African Americans in the Senate, and I could lose one this cycle for a good reason. Not nearly enough. So victory is more important than ever. This is our foundation. This is our foundation for our community and successful policies going forward. And so uh, it's why I wanted to do this. It's why I want to double down on victory because we do not nearly have enough. We don't have a transgender elected a person in the state legislature in California. So what does that say? It's not enough to get one or two in states that we target and say, wow, we got one in, in this state or that state. Not nearly enough. West Virginia, not enough. So support Victory. It's why we're all here. And I love these great women. It's been a wonderful time this morning. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all. I, I want to bring my perspective to it. Um, I, I think I said earlier that uh, my sister and I were part of a group of 14 to integrate um, a high school in the heart of Alabama in 1969. That was not easy at all. And uh, a lot of people thought, well, now that you, if you get one, then that's enough. Or if you get two, then that's enough. And sometimes they would look for somebody that would fill all three categories and say, we hired this one person and now we have enough. But that is not enough. Uh, and, and I believe that sometimes people ask those questions because they're so afraid of their world changing. There, there is a predominant thought that is associated with hetero patriarchy. And, and that sets the, the, the frame, if you will, for what is, quote, normal, whatever that means. Um, and those are the people who are trying to hang on to the vestiges of the past. And uh, someone asked me the other day, said, Do you, well, don't you think it's because they're afraid their world is changing? And I, 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 I gave them this example. When I first went to Korea, that was my first um, assignment when I was a commissioned second lieutenant, my first assignment. I was a supply officer and I had to sign for everything that was in our company area. I had some buildings, for beds, for sheets, for mattresses, everything, everything. And I had to go around and I counted to make sure that they were there. The last thing in the property book was, was this, this thing that I couldn't see because I only had a secret clearance and you needed a top secret clearance to see it. And I, I argued with the company commander. I said, sir, if I can't see it, I can't sign for it. And he said, you know, Lieutenant, you will sign for this. I said, sir, I can't. After we went a couple of times with that, he, he said, I'm giving you a direct order, Lieutenant Spearman, to sign for this equipment. And I signed and I put under my signature, but I did not see it. OK, I could not see this thing that was top secret in 1979. And this thing that was top secret was a fax machine a fax machine. And, and I said that to say, 
I did not know at the time the value of a fax machine, did not know that it was going to change the way we communicated. You know, it was the, the forerunner of email. I did not know that. For those people who are afraid that acknowledging who we are, that acknowledging that we're here, that we've always been here, and that we, here's my womanness, we ain't going nowhere, okay? For those people who are afraid of all of that, I say to you, don't fear that your world is changing. Please accept the fact that it already has, and now you need to adjust to the change because the world is not going back. That doesn't mean that the fight is finished. That doesn't mean that we've overcome all the way, but it simply means that the very fact that we are here in public and we're talking about this, and we're talking about this unafraid, we're talking about this unapologetically, the very fact, our very presence, our very presence consecrates this moment in history that says the world has already changed. And so for those who are afraid that letting us in, or giving us our due diligence, guess what? The world has already changed. The world has already changed. And anyone who was born into privilege and has accepted that as the way you look at the world, guess what? This last 45 minutes, you have no idea what we've been talking about. But I tell you what, if you listen to it, if you rewind it and listen to it again, you'll get a better clue. The world has already changed. Now it's up to you to change. Hey, thank you all. Thank you all. This has been fun. It's been real. It's been real fun. And I look forward to, to hearing and talking to many of you all a lot more. Thank you, Victory Fund. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone who has participated uh, in this. So we'll see you next time around. Uh, I'm going to date myself. Same bat channel, same bat time. Okay. Happy Pride, weekend, everyone. Everybody. Happy Pride. Happy Pride.